We're delighted to have as our commencement speaker today, Dr. Gary Loveman. Dr. Loveman is a former professor of business at Harvard University, having earned his doctorate in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is the chairman, CEO, and president of Harris Entertainment, the world's largest gaming company. He is responsible for the corporation's unprecedented growth. In his tenure, he developed Harris's very successful loyalty program, Total Rewards, which analyzes customer needs and numbers, as many as 50 million clients. For the past two years, Harris has been the host of the Stockton Scholarship Gala. The total proceeds from that gala has brought approximately $1.7 million, benefiting our scholarship programs. The scholarship program for Harris employees alone now stands at $175,000. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Gary Loveman. President Sotkamp, thank you. Members of the faculty, it's a pleasure to put this robe back on and join you this morning. Ms. Spat, congratulations on your terrific accomplishments here at the school. This is a comfortable place for a casino guy to spend his morning. There are scarcely any windows. The exits are poorly marked. I think this is going to work out fine. I'll warn you that in my academic career, the organic unit of time was 80 minutes, so make yourselves comfortable. Just, just kidding. Graduations mark a conclusion of sorts, a validation that a set of standards of accomplishment have been met, and the graduates are ready to proceed into a new set of challenges that you've heard my colleagues this morning describe. And for the parents in the audience, they also fortunately mark an end to those troubling tuition bills that seem to arrive more frequently than we expected. To all of the graduates today, to your parents, loved ones, and those who are so proud of you this morning, I extend my heartiest congratulations to each of you on this very important milestone in your lives. To the faculty and staff of Stockton, a terrific and an institution on the rise in every sense of the word, I commend you on your dedication to teaching, to scholarship, and to the development of the young people before you. Now, what would a commencement speech be without a reminiscence? 29, 27 years ago, I was seated where all of you were, and I thought I was about to go off and be a banker. Thank God that didn't work out. I wound up instead as a teacher at the Harvard Graduate School of Business, a vocational school of sorts, and after nine years there, I and my closest friend, who was also on the faculty, left to go into two very different businesses. He went to run Victoria's Secret, and I went to run a gambling business. <laughs> you can only imagine the disappointment and embarrassment to Harvard University that two of its faculty members went to run lingerie and gambling in the same year. <laughs> As you sit in this room this morning, what you don't know yet is what you're capable of. You couldn't possibly imagine what's ahead of you. You have some thoughts about how the next few weeks and months might define themselves. But as was the case with me and with so many of the folks on this stage, it's impossible to tell what the future will bring you. You're capable of such remarkable things. And the question is, what will you do to make sure that every day you make it as possible, as humanly possible itself, to achieve what you're capable of doing? What I'd like to share with you this morning are a few thoughts that might surprise you about what I consider to be some of the defining elements that lead individuals at your station in life from the potential, the raw talent that sits with us this morning to a remarkable level of accomplishment as your life proceeds. Now, as you've heard, the classes are over, the degrees are about to be granted, but the learning is just beginning. And the learning that faces you in the most challenging sense is not learning that you'll find typically in disciplinary study in textbooks, or even in the written word to a very large degree. Rather, it's self-reflective learning. It's learning about yourself and learning about your own actions, learning about that which you can be self-critical, being open to the notion that the legacy of problems ahead of you are to some degree of your own making, and be willing to consider that there are ways through your own action that you can define for yourself and your critical constituents a better world. Now, as President Sotkamp has said, you graduate into a very difficult circumstance. We're living through the worst economic calamity in most of our lives, certainly in the last 70 years. When I first donned this robe 20 years ago in 1989 at MIT, we were entering a period of remarkable institutional crisis as well. You'll remember that that was the time that 
totalitarian communist rule was falling in Central and Eastern Europe. It was a time of remarkable hope, optimism, and cathartic institutional events. We watched as a trade union in a Polish shipyard led the freedom of tens of millions of people from the most unlikely of places with the most unlikely of leaders. We saw suddenly one evening a news bulletin that the Berlin Wall would be opened at 10.53 that evening and a country separated for decades would be allowed to reunify in front of all of us. The parents in the audience my age or nearly my age remember that moment as one of the defining moments of our lives. Now, as I left MIT in 1989, I had the good fortune and serendipity to go and spend the first few years of my life studying the events in the immediate aftermath of the liberalization of Central and Eastern Europe. And during that time, along the way, I met some of the most remarkable people, indeed some of the most remarkable learners. They were defined not by their vocations, but instead by their capacity to learn and indeed to lead. They came from places you would never imagine. They were farmers and electricians and shipbuilders and priests and poets. They led based on what they knew about themselves. They led based on the reflection that came from years of imprisonment, persecution, the violation of basic human and civil rights over a very long period of time. And they thought reflectively and considerably about what they might do to create a better place in the event the opportunity were to present itself. One of my favorites during this period, a man who I had the great good fortune to meet during this time, was a poet, a Czech playwright named Václav Havel, who went from the halls of academia to the presidency of his country, the Czech Republic. In 1990, shortly after the establishment of a liberalized Czechoslovakia and later Czech Republic, Havel addressed the United States Congress he did not speak of revenge, he did not speak of imprisonment of those who had oppressed him, but he spoke instead of learning and responsibility. And his words linger with me, and they're words that I refresh myself on frequently. He said, we still don't know how to put morality ahead of politics, science, and economics. We're still incapable of understanding that the only genuine backbone of all of our actions, if they are to be moral, is responsibility. Responsibility to something higher than family, higher than country, higher than firm, higher than individual success, higher than financial remuneration. Responsibility to the order of being where all of our actions are indelibly recorded and where and only where they are to be properly judged. So graduates, this notion of responsibility I think is a central one that I hope will guide you and upon which you will reflect consistently as you face decisions that you could not possibly anticipate as we meet this morning. And I suggest to you that it comes deeply from self-reflection, from a consideration of your actions, the antecedents of those actions, your motivations and those consequences. Now I want to point out that self-reflection is a very difficult, I mean, I should say a very different concept than self-absorption. Teenagers, MTV stars, and most of American society is deeply dedicated to self-absorption. We're all pretty good at it. I have a couple of teenagers at home, and I think they exemplify self-absorption remarkably well. I'm talking about something different. I'm talking about the capacity to reflect on one's own activities, to learn from one's own actions, and to seek as fundamentally as possible the clearest-headed notion of how to proceed. And let me be clear what I mean by this. Most of us learn, and particularly as adults, most of us learn through trial and error and experiential activities that involve mastering things that we think have been successful for us in the past. So we observe a problem, we undertake an action, we see that it works out reasonably well, so the next time we're confronted with such a problem, we take essentially the same course. You might think of this as exemplified by a thermostat set at a certain temperature that every time the temperature drops below the set level, it kicks on the furnace and the temperature is restored. This is a single loop style of learning. It suggests a very fixed series of causal connection that defines how we consider reaction to known circumstances. It is a single loop idea that becomes an incredible impediment to innovation, the sustenance of bad ideas, and a tremendous blocker for progress. Instead, I would ask you to consider the very important concept of why am I taking the problem in this way? Why, if I'm a, ther a thermostat, am I set at 68 degrees? Why is the solution to turn on the furnace at precisely that level? 
why don't I consider a different way to address the problem? How in my world do I find a solution that is a winner for the guests of my business, the people who work there and the communities in which they work? And why do I feel personally threatened when people criticize the way I've considered this problem in the past? And perhaps most importantly, as I consider the problem objectively and with a distance perspective, what is my responsibility in this setting? We see historically the consequences of this single loop reactive learning in the wake of Vietnam, in the wake of the Iraqi war and the war on terror, and certainly in the wake of our current economic collapse. We see a single loop style of learning occurring in the mortgage crisis, in the U.S. housing crisis, surely in the financial crisis. We saw it on the morning before the collapse of Lehman Brothers when the chief financial officer stood before the public and indicated that his bank was just fine, thank you. That is a failure of reflective thought that rests fundamentally with each of us. One of the proudest traditions of scholarly life, the life that you have led these last four or five years, is the dedication to the supremacy of an idea. Not he or she who owns the idea, but the idea itself. The capacity to isolate the idea, consider it on its merits, criticize it and evaluate it thoroughly, and proceed as the idea best indicates. This is the type of non-defensive, thoughtful, reflective activity I'm describing. So as you proceed today forward into whatever task or activity awaits you, I would encourage you to consider a few notions that you might keep close to the front of your mind. The first is, rather than being defensive of criticism, seek it out actively. Put, you in the put yourself in the company of those who are most likely to disagree, not least likely to disagree. Find those whose opinions are most challenging, solicit their view, consider the most diverse possible frameworks and perspectives, and put your ideas, your assumptions, your inferences consistently to the test, and recognize where your own defensiveness will impede you. Now let me focus on that just for a moment. If I were to take one of you at random and say to you, you're a bad golfer. For most of you, that's not a very offensive notion, since most of you don't play golf, and for those of you who do, most of you are bad golfers. <laughs> if I were to instead ask any one of the graduates to stand, and I were to say to him or her, you're a bad student, that would likely feel much worse. And if I were to do it in public this morning, which I'm not going to do, the moment I were to say it, your emotions would run. Your heart would pace a bit more briskly. You might begin to perspire ever so slightly, and it would feel lousy. And you will find in your life countless circumstances where you seek to avoid precisely those moments. But it is exactly those moments where the greatest learning occurs. If you ask any of those who work with me, you'll find that I seek to put them in that position routinely, precisely because we find that that is where the greatest learning arises. And it arises because we're prepared to say, you know, how am I in fact a bad student? What data are you suggesting would indicate that I could be a better student. Where might I improve? How would I reconsider the notion? And whether this speaks to our professional lives, our personal lives, our parenting, the care of our elders, our role in the community, the same argument applies. So as we are willing to stand down from this defensiveness and move ahead to something that feels more expansive in our thinking, we ask, what problem am I trying to solve and to whom am I responsible here? How do I frame this in a way that leads to the most responsible action? Why do I feel defensive about it? When I meet new employees of Harrah's, as I try to do in every instance, I say to them, there is nothing you could do to screw this company up as badly as I have. And I regale them with examples of decisions I've made that have cost the company millions, tens of millions of dollars, and I suggest them there is no way that you will have the opportunity to screw up at my level. And in so doing, I hope I suggest to them that that's okay. You can take chances, you can make mistakes, you will make mistakes. And what I'm asking is rather that you consider the process by which this occurred and how we might collectively learn as a result. Now, a lot of history has begun with good intentions. So many of the things that have led to trouble and misery in this world began by those who had only the best of intentions. But along the way, step by step, Slippery slopes were encountered, decisions were made, single loop learnings occurred, and it became okay to start to do irresponsible things. There is no doubt that, that in the financial collapse you've just witnessed, 
automobile company CEOs flying to the U.S. Congress for aid in Gulf Streams, bankers telling their depositors that the bank was fine only to see the bank close 12 hours later. Any number of instances in some way began by good people with good intentions, but along the way, a series of careless and defensive decisions led to a very bad result. So it is our responsibility to recognize at each step of the way how our own thinking, our own reflective critical perspective can intrude upon what could be a very bad dynamic and set it in a different direction. Twelve years after Vaclav Havel became president of the Czech Republic, twelve years after his speech to the United States Congress, he spoke again at the City University of, Remar of New York, remarking on the rebuilding of his country and the reestablishment of the soul of the Czech Republic. He said, and I quote, if we examine all the problems facing the world today, whether they be economic, social, ecological, or the general problems of a civilized society, we will always, whether we wish to or not, come up against the problem of whether a course of action is decent and whether from a long-term point of view it is responsible. So 2009 Stockton graduates before me, the classes are over, the degrees about to be in your hands, well earned, the celebrations I'm sure are about to begin. But the learning, the hardest part of the learning, the learning for which you are uniquely and individually accountable, the critical, unpleasant, self-reflective learning is about to begin. All of us in this room, all of us in this state, all of us around the country, we depend on you, we need you, and we need your best. Congratulations and Godspeed to each of you. Thank you, Dr. Loveman. Dr. Hoover, it's my distinct pleasure to recommend to you for the conferral of the Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa, Dr. Gary Loveman. <clears throat> Dr. Satcamp, I accept your nomination of Dr. Gary Loveman for the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters with this salutation. Upon the recommendation of the faculty, the Board of Trustees hereby confers upon Dr. Gary Loveman the degree of Honorary Doctor of Humane Letters with all the rights, honors, and privileges thereunto to appertaining.